Hi everyone, and welcome to Biology Professor. Today is an introduction to fungal pathogens. Now, the study of fungi is called mycology. And before we start talking about various important human fungal pathogens, first I want to emphasize that actually a lot of fungi are good. They're beneficial to humans. There are over 100,000 known species of fungi, and of those 100,000, only about 100 are thought to be pathogenic. There are numerous good fungi that confer various benefits, so let's talk about those first. First of all, fungi are valuable as decomposers. These are fungi that are in the environment, that help to break down wastes and dead plants and dead animals and other things in order to return nutrients to the soil and then to the larger ecosystem as a whole. Also, fungi are useful as a food source. This includes many varieties of mushrooms that humans can eat. Also, fungi are essential to the production of various products, for example, Various varieties of yeasts, which are a type of fungus, are used in the production of alcohol and bread, where they serve to ferment sugars to help with the production of these food sources. And then also, fungi are an important source of antibiotics. They are able to produce antibiotics that are active against various bacterial pathogens. For example, the first antibiotic that was ever discovered was discovered by Alexander Fleming when he was noticing in his lab he had some mold growing, a penicillium species, and it was able to produce something that could inhibit the growth of bacteria. So those penicillium molds are where we get the antibiotic penicillin. these are the various ways in which many fungi are actually good for us. But now let's talk about those important human pathogens. Okay, so now let's get into talking about some important human fungal pathogens. I've broken these down into three categories just to aid our discussion. First, let's talk about opportunistic pathogens. What this means is an opportunistic pathogen is one where this particular fungus is found in many humans, in normal, healthy human tissues. But sometimes, if given the right opportunity, it can lead to an infection, called an opportunistic infection. Examples of these types of fungi are Candida albicans and Pneumocystis urevetsi. With Candida albicans, it causes a disease called candidiasis. Or thrush. These are infections of the mouth or the vagina that are a result of Candida albicans fungal infection. Um, Pneumocystis urevetsi is what causes, you may have heard of it, it's called pneumocystic pneumonia. Or sometimes you'll hear it referred to as PCP. Now, these are infections that occur um, usually in immunocompromised patients. So in particular, Candida albicans causes infections mostly in people that are immunosuppressed. So these would be patients with AIDS or newborn babies. Um, pneumocystic pneumonia is particularly a major danger to those that have AIDS because they are immunosuppressed, so their bodies cannot fight these potential pathogens to kind of keep them in check. It's also possible, particularly for candidiasis infections, for this to occur in normal healthy individuals after they've taken a regimen of broad spectrum antibiotics. Why is this? This is because as humans we have bacteria all over our bodies, inside our bodies, that are good symbiotic mutualistic bacteria. Um, and one of the things that they do is they kind of fill this niche in our bodies where they use available nutrients and they keep any other things that are present from overgrowing. But if someone gets a bacterial infection 
and then they have to take a broad spectrum antibiotic treatment in order to cure their bacterial their bacterial um, infection. Then, of course, the bacteria that's infecting them will be treated and will, will disappear, but also so will many of these mutualistic bacteria, meaning that they can no longer prevent overgrowth of possible fun fungi that are present. So this is one way in which candida albicans can actually cause an infection in people that aren't immunosuppressed. Now let's talk about another way that fungal infections can occur in humans. This is through environmental reservoirs. So unlike opportunistic pathogens that can actually be a part of the normal human flora and then just cause infections sort of when the opportunity presents itself, these are fungal pathogens that can be establishing an infection in a human following their contraction from an environmental reservoir. So first of all, let's talk about what diseases they cause. There's histoplasma capsulatum, which causes a disease called histoplasmosis. There is blastomyces dermatitidis, which causes a disease called blastomycosis. And then there is coccidioides emetis. It causes a disease called coccidioideomycosis. Since this one is kind of hard to say, it has a common name of valley fever. Now, how do you contract these, these pathogens? Histoplasma capsulatum is found in animal droppings, mainly bird droppings and bat droppings. Blastomyces dermatitidis is found in moist soil. Coccidioides emetis is found in dry, arid soils. But all three of them are endemic to the United States uh, and as well as other countries. Now, how do you get them from the environmental reservoirs? Basically, any time that you are disrupting the environment, so if you are disrupting the animal droppings or the soil by gardening or digging or raking leaves or camping or having a picnic, um, you run the risk of basically disrupting the fungal cells, releasing them into the environment and inhaling them. That means that the, the primary type of infection for all of these, these, these diseases is a lung infection. And the symptoms are similar to that of a flu or pneumonia. So coughing, um, wheezing, fever, which can make them difficult to diagnose if you don't know what you've been exposed to. Also, all three of these, while they are primarily lung infections, it is possible for them to disseminate to other regions of the body. This is called becoming a systemic infection. So they can spread to other organs and even spread to the central nervous system. This happens, it results in fungal meningitis, which can be a serious infection. Finally, let's talk about that third grouping, dermatophytes. Dermatophytes cause infections of hair, skin, and nails. So while these infections are not as serious as some of the other ones we've discussed today, they, it's more of, of a nuisance. So for example, this would include athlete's foot. And ringworm. The result of these diseases are that the infected area is usually red, it can become scaly and itchy, but it can usually be treated pretty easily um, and it's not life threatening. So those are our examples of human fungal pathogens. You can see that there's a lot of diversity here. But before I leave you, I do want to emphasize that there are species of fungi that infect other non-human hosts. For example, there are fungi that infect plants. So Dutch elm disease and potato blight are caused by fungi, and these have important agricultural um, consequences. There are also species of fungi that infect amphibians. So for example, um, Batrachochytrium dendrobatidis is a fungal species that is responsible for amphibian declines and even amphibian distinctions around the globe. 
So certainly there are many important fungal pathogens out there that we should be aware of. But that's it for today. Thank you for watching, and I hope you learned a lot.